Okay, today we'll have uh, Dr. Yuri Buckman from the uh, Mortgage Institute for Research, which is located in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And the Mor uh, Mor Mortgage Institute it has an extensive partnership with the uh, University of Wisconsin um, Madison. And um, um, Dr. Uh, Yuri ha um, Buckman has been working there for many years and he has he received his uh, PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and he has done extensive work on several omics domains, including um, proteomics, um, transcriptomics, and also genomics. And he has worked on the genome of several organisms, including, we were just chatting, uh, the uh, biggest mammal on earth, the blue whale, and then also on um, the uh, Nile rat. So today he's going to talk about the genome of Nile rat. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yeah, uh, it's not okay, in so presentation I'm... mode yet. Yeah, let me put it in the presentation mode. All right. So uh, thank you for the introduction. And, uh, Let's talk about the Nile rat. So the Nile rat is also known as uh, African grass rat, uh, and it inhabits a wide area in the Nile River Valley and Sub-Saharan Africa, where it is an important agricultural pest. Our Nile rat colony is, uh, oops, sorry, is managed by Hui Shito at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In contrast to the commonly used model species, house mouse and brown rat, now rat is susceptible to diet-induced diabetes like humans. It's also diurnal. Um, we will be comparing now rat to house mouse and Norway rat and white-footed mouse in this study. So I would like to say a few words about the relationship between these species. Um, Nile rat, uh, house mouse, and Norway rat all belong to the subfamily Murina, and are thought to have diverged appro approximately 8 to 10 million years ago, when multiple Murine species radiated from a common ancestor. House mouse and Norway rat are nocturnal and omnivorous, and furthermore, since they have lived in human homes and settlements for thousands of generations, they may well be adapted to our food better than we are. For example, a study of Norway rats' food preferences published in 1953 found that they particularly liked scrambled eggs and mac and cheese. Um, and uh, this doesn't make them necessarily great models of diabetes. Except for some specially bred strains, they don't spontaneously develop diabetes by eating their own diet. In contrast, now rat in its natural habitat, eats primarily low-calorie vegetarian foods such as grasses, leaves, and stems of flowering plants. In the lab, now rat stays healthy on rabbit chow, but develops diabetes when given standard mouse feed instead. Um, while this doesn't exactly make now rats into little humans, we can certainly hope that uh, working on this model would enable us to develop a deeper understanding of the mechanisms of that induced diabetes. Uh, we have worked on the genome with the Vertebrate Genomes Project, an international consortium of researchers whose goal is to generate reference quality genome assemblies of all vertebrate species. The VGP includes some of the world's top experts oops, uh, in genome assembly and curation. And uh, some of the photos are here. This is the overview of the VGP genome assembly workflow, which was used for the now rat. Uh, so the genome assembly is based on pack by alone read technology. First, pack by reads are assembled into context. This draft assembly is purged of spurious duplications that are occasionally generated by assembly algorithms. This is followed by three scaffolding steps, which join the context into scaffolds that have some gaps, but often approach whole chromosomes in length. 
These steps utilize 10x linked short reads, optical maps, and high C. Short reads are then mapped back to the assembly and used to fix base level errors and small windows. Finally, the assembly is manually curated to fix scaffolding errors. Julio Fermenti did most of the assembly work, and Alan Tracy and William Cho, uh, who worked with uh, Kirsten Ho at, uh, at the Sanger Institute, did the curation. So in addition to that, uh, with Nalrat, uh, we used three of binion uh, technique to completely face the two haplotypes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, 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 this figure uh, illustrates the three of binion methodology as it was explained in the original paper. Uh, short read sequencing of the parents enabled us to identify k uh, that were unique to each parent. These k-mers were used to sort pack bio reads from the child into paternal and maternal bins. Paternal and maternal haplotypes were then assembled independently from the reads, um, from the reads that were assigned to each bin. Uh, so, and this was uh, uh, the the methodology was developed in Adam Philippi's group, and uh, his group did the short read sequencing of the parents. Uh, genome curation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Genome annotation. Uh, so, uh, to annotate the genomes, genes are usually inferred based on RNA seq data. Uh, homology and ab initio gene prediction algorithms. And for this project, we uh, specially generated uh, ISA-seq uh, data from the brain and testes, which are organs where most, uh, that are most rich in uh, expressed transcripts. And so this is part of the VGP methodology. Uh, if uh, brain and testis tissues from the animal are accessible. They do isoseq to facilitate genome annotation. Uh, the annotation was done by NCBI and by Ensemble, uh, who both predicted genes, pseudogenes, uh, repeats, uh, and other features. And uh, it's available from the genome pages at NCBI Ensemble and also it's available at the UCSC genome browser. Uh, I should say that uh, both NCBI and Ensemble only annotated the primary haplotype, uh, which is uh, uh, paternal plus maternal X chromosome. And uh, this is what's available on their sites at and at UCSC, although UCSC, I think, has their alternate assembly as well when they develop the gene annotations. Uh, we also use TOGA, which stands for tool to infer orthologs from genome alignments. Uh, and that uh, was developed by My Michael Hiller's lab. Uh, uh, and uh, Michael Hiller and uh, Bogdan Kirilenka and Chitan Minigada are currently at Lowe Center for Translational Biodiversity Genomics in Frankfurt in Germany. Uh, so this tool projects human and mouse genes uh, to uh, a genome that's being annotated. Uh, and so this is sort of an alternative annotation technique. And they annotated both the primary and the alternate haplotype. And uh, that turned out to be quite useful in some cases. Uh, so their annotations are available uh, from the Sunkenberg Genome Browser, which is an instance of uh, UCSC Genome Browser at the institution, which has all the TOGA annotations in it. Uh, we also predicted uh, GO terms uh, for all the proteins that were annotated by NCBI. 
And for this, we used the Philo PFP software uh, developed by uh, Ashish Jain and uh, Daisuke Kaihara. And they're the ones who did the predictions. And uh, we also annotated segmental duplications that was done by Mark Chesson, and it will be discussed in detail later. We also linked now rat genes uh, uh, to type 2 diabetes uh, using databases and text mining. So this work was uh, done uh, mostly by Kalpana Raja, uh, who was a postdoc uh, in our lab, and uh, by our PI, Ron Stewart, for whom text mining is uh, kind of his primary research interest. Uh, so uh, they were able to link more than 4,000 human genes to type 2 diabetes with various types of evidence. Uh, first, sort of the strongest evidence is uh, from curated databases, uh, which are comparative toxicogenomics database and farm, K, uh, farm GKB. Uh, then uh, there was uh, also a GWAS database. Uh, that was used. And finally, the two text mining tools developed in the Stewart lab. Uh, first is Kinderminer. Uh, so Kinderminer uh, uh, links genes to disease based on their co-occurrence in PubMed abstracts. So this is a relatively simple technique, contingency table based. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, the, if a gene and disease occur in the same abstract more frequently than you would expect by chance, then they're linked together. Uh, and the second tool is serial kinderminer, which works in a similar way, uh, but you don't link genes to disease directly, you link uh, genes to the symptoms uh, of, the, of, of the disease and to disease-related phenotypes. Uh, so this, of course, casts wider net, uh, uh, but uh, maybe you you are a little less confident about the, the hits. And so um, uh, this slide has a Venn diagram that shows the total number of hits uh, by different methods uh, and uh, their overlap. Uh, we uh, also ranked uh, genes by the strength of evidence using a scoring scheme assigning uh, uh, a score of pre to genes from curated databases, two from uh, GWAS or Kinderminer, and one from, from STEM. And uh, if there's more than type of evidence, then the scores are added. And so the table of all these genes is available as a supplementary material to our paper. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the genome assembly. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of the most contiguous and complete of the publicly available rodent assemblies. Uh, oops. Slides get advanced by, their, by themselves. Anyway, so uh, panel B uh, uh, shows the synteny between the two uh, parental haplotypes. Uh, so the reference genome is paternal plus maternal X, but we also have a complete maternal genome. And, uh, uh, you can see that they're uh, sort of, uh, they're mostly the same, but there are some uh, translocations and so forth. Uh, so then uh, panel C, uh, shows assembly contiguity metrics of rodent genome assemblies in the NCBI database. Uh, so now RAT uh, is shown in red. Uh, its Latin name is Arbicantis neuroticus. And uh, I've also shown in blue uh, Mus musculus and Radus norvegicus. And uh, so the horizontal axis is contig N50 and the vertical axis is scaffold N50. Um, and uh, you can see that on both measures, uh, um, NARAT uh, 
approaches the, the two model organisms. Uh, the other dots that are in gray are other publicly available rodent assemblies in the NCBI assembly database. Uh, so a lot of them are short read assemblies, so they're a lot, a lot less continuous. But obviously, now that is one of the best rodent assemblies out there by the measure of contiguity. Um, panel D uh, shows uh, Basco scores. Uh, and uh, as far as Basco percent complete is concerned, our assembly is also one of the most complete among the rodents. Uh, since we have uh, two complete haplotypes, uh, uh, we could uh, uh, catalog uh, all the uh, heterozygous variants between them. This work was done by Chintao Yang from the Beijing Genomics Institute. And he, uh, uh, he had cataloged all, all sorts of features from uh, uh, single nucleotide variants uh, to uh, large uh, inversions, translocations, inversion translocations, and copy number variants. Uh, this plot shows uh, heterozygosity across the genome. Uh, so the inner ring shows density of heterozygous uh, single nucleotide variants. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, going from inside out are uh, indels uh, of up to 50 bases. Um, uh, uh, then uh, insertion and deletion structural variants that are 50 bases or, or longer, and the outer limb shows translocations. Um, yeah, you can kind of see that um, uh, there are some regions uh, of the genome where there isn't much heterozygosity, and it looks like um, different types of heterozygosity correlate with each other. Uh, so, this uh, uh, now rat colony is somewhat inbred. They're uh, descendants of several animals that were brought from Africa uh, some time ago. And so, so the homozygous uh, uh, regions might be the consequence of inbreeding. Um, this is the length distribution of structural variants, uh, and the dashed lines uh, um, are uh, at uh, uh, 300, 500, and uh, 4,500 uh, uh, bases, uh, and those coincide with some of the commonly annotated uh, repetitive elements. So panel A shows indels, and panel B shows other structural variants, and uh, there are some peaks uh, that coincide with, with this uh, that lines, which are probably uh, originate from repetitive elements. Here's an example of heter a heterozygous gene, uh, HADH. Uh, so in the primary assembly, HADH appears disrupted. So this is in panel A. Uh, it's annotated with, by NCBI, nevertheless, uh, as a protein coding gene, but it only has three exons, whereas we know that in other animals, uh, this gene has eight exons. And uh, you can see there's a gap track. So, so this is a, a snapshot from the UCSC browser. Uh, and there's a gap here disrupting, uh, interrupting the, the second intron. So it so happened that the alternate assembly actually does have a complete gene with eight exons. Uh, and uh, we also have two isosic transcripts, both, both from brain and from testis, that map perfectly well to the alternate assembly. Uh, so for something like this, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, uh, there is really heterozygosity there. Or is that a problem with the primary assembly? 
uh, where there is high trizygosity, what exactly is, is happening. Obviously, you have a gap when a region is hard to assemble, which happens with highly repetitive regions, for example. By the way, if you have questions here, feel free to interrupt. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, uh, segmental duplications. Uh, these were annotated by Mark Chison who is an assistant professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, these are defined uh, as duplicated segments of at least one kilobase in length that are at least 90% identical to each other. They are not transposable elements, rather they are thought to arise through genome replication and recombination errors. They often contain genes and are an important driver of evolution. They are detected by aligning the genome to itself to find near identical segments. Um, back. Uh, so all known repetitive elements are masked before uh, this procedure. Uh, and uh, some duplications cannot yet be resolved by assembly algorithms. And so they end up collapsed, uh, where multiple duplicated segments uh, existing in the genome get collapsed into a single segment in the assembly. Such collapsed duplications can still be detected as peaks in coverage depth when sequencing reads are mapped back to the assembly. The cartoon on this slide illustrates both resolved and collapsed duplications. So the vertical axis is, uh, is the coverage, and uh, you can see that there's a peak in coverage. Uh, here are some examples of duplicated genes in NAURA. Panel A shows a resolved duplication of the ACNAP gene. The house mouse genome is at the top and NAURA at the bottom. The arcs connect homo uh, homologous segments. You can see that the house mouse has two copies of this gene, while NARAD has four. Panel B shows a dot plot of the NARAD ACNAP gene, uh, gene cluster uh, that's aligned to itself. You can observe that the leftmost copy is, an inver is in an inverse orientation compared to the other three copies. Panel C shows a collapsed duplication. This is a plot of read coverage versus genomic coordinate in the neighborhood of the SLFN3 uh, gene. The horizontal green line signifies the average coverage across the genome, so there is clearly a coverage peak in this region. The position of the gene is marked by transcripts inferred from isosic data and aligned to the genome. This plot shows the number of duplicated gene copies in now rat, Norway rat, house mouse, and white footed mouse. The relatively large numbers at high percent identity suggest uh, recent increases in segmental duplication activity in, in all of these species. However, the strongest burst of such activity happened in the house mouse, which had been previously reported by others. Two different house mouse genome assemblies are shown uh, in this slide, uh, they are shown in blue and green with lighter colors signifying collapsed duplications. The two now rat haplotypes are in red and orange. This is functional classification of duplicated genes uh, in uh, um, all of these uh, uh, different assemblies. And uh, you can see that uh, there are a number of olfactory genes, olfactory receptor genes, and zinc finger genes, which is as expected. Uh, the predicted, uh, which is in blue, uh, means uh, that uh, these genes were not assigned any functions. They, are, they, they have been predicted by NCBI, uh, but uh, no function is known.
Uh, one cluster of duplicated genes uh, we, that we paid particular attention to was the amylases. Amylase is an enzyme that helps digest starch. It had been previously reported that various species acquired additional copies of amylase when they adapted to starchy diets, including humans, dogs, mice, and rats. The now rat eats a low starch diet of, of plant shoot, shoots and leaves. Not surprisingly, it has free functional amylase genes, um, uh, whereas uh, Norway rat has five and house mouse has seven. So it's conceivable that, amyl, uh, that now rat is losing some amylase genes that it used to have. Uh, this plot uh, is from Toga. So this is a snapshot of the Sentinberg uh, genome browser. And uh, um, uh, so there is a track for uh, mouse gene projections uh, to the now rat genome uh, and then human gene project projections, and then RefSeq annotations and ensemble annotations. And uh, the projections that are in blue, uh, dark blue, are complete intact genes. Uh, so you can see that there are three of them. And there are two more that are in red. So these are either incomplete or have deactivated mutations. Uh, and so uh, one uh, of these genes was annotated by NCBI as alpha amylase 1, and the other two as uh, uh, pancreatic alpha amylase-like. Um, this is uh, uh, more about the amylase gene cluster. Uh, so panel A uh, shows uh, house mouse uh, genome uh, on the top and now rat at the bottom. And again, uh, arcs uh, connect uh, homologous segments. And uh, you can see uh, that now rat uh, has, uh, uh, I'm sorry, house mouse has uh, six uh, functional genes and the pseudogen, which is a darker color here. Uh, now rat has uh, three functional genes and pseudogen. Uh, so then panel B uh, is uh, a pairwise similarity of the gene sequences in uh, human now rat uh, mouse Norway rat. Uh, and the genes are ordered according to, to their genomic coordinates. So this uh, uh, dark blue square in the center, these are uh, the amylase two genes from the mouse that are highly, um, you know, almost a hundred percent identical to each other. And the blue square in the lower left are the amylase genes from human uh, that uh, obviously have uh, expanded. Uh, independently of the rodents. Finally, panel C shows a similar story, but th this is a, a tree uh, from the multiple alignment uh, of uh, amylase proteins. And so the human proteins form a separate cluster at the bottom, separate from the rodents. And in rodents, uh, we have the amylase one cluster which has one gene from each species that we're looking at. Uh, and then for amylase two, uh, each uh, species has its own cluster. So these uh, genes probably have been expanded uh, independently in each lineage. But in our rat, there are only two of them, uh, whereas uh, in, in the other species, there are several. Uh, this is uh, a gene. Uh, so we have compared uh, duplications, uh, uh, duplicated genes in NARA to the mouse, 
to look at the differences. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, one gene that's duplicated in our rat, but not in the mouse, GCKR. So this is glucokinase regulatory protein. It, uh, it is important for diabetes uh, because it regulates uptake and storage of dietary glucose. Um, and uh, the Marx segmental duplication workflow finds two result copies of this gene. And uh, 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 this is the uh, a multiple alignment uh, of these two uh, to other rodent uh, uh, gluc uh, GCKR genes. And uh, this, uh, the second copy is in the top row. Uh, and uh, uh, these two uh, uh, marked by red, the, the, the two amino acids mark, marked by red uh, are in a binding site. Uh, for one of the ligands that it binds. And uh, um, so the, the second NARAD copy is in the top row. The first NARAD copy, uh, the one that's actually annotated as GCKR, GCKR, is in the second row. And you can see is that sort of this canonical GCKR is uh, identical to the other rodents, whereas the, the duplicate is not. Uh, probably this binding site was lost. Uh, in fact, it's annotated uh, as a pseudogene by NCBI, but I think Ensemble predicts that it's a functional protein coding gene. Uh, so TOGA also finds inactivated mutations in the second copy. And it also finds five more truncated copies on three different uh, scaffolds. Uh, uh, so, and uh, if we take the canonical gene and uh, um, do a blood search against the NARAD genome, we get 25 hits, and uh, four of them are annotated as pseudogenes by NCBI. Uh, we also used uh, uh, Toga to uh, try to assess gene loss and gain in now rat compared to the house mouse. Uh, so if you take all mouse genes and you subtract those mouse genes uh, that were projected to now rat by Toga, then uh, uh, you you get putative gene losses in now rat compared to mouse. Uh, now, from the experience of looking at genes like HAD H, uh, I know that uh, I have to look at both now at haplotypes and only look at homozygous losses. Uh, looking at specific examples, uh, it, it looks like these are probably usually gains in mouse rather than losses in now rat. Uh, so one example we looked at uh, was this or or ORM, uh, which is orosomucoid uh, gene cluster, uh, which has uh, uh, basically this gene has uh, uh, three copies in mouse and only one in now rat. So this is uh, probably a gene gain in mouse. Uh, the other two I've looked at uh, that are also connected to diabetes. Uh, these are retrogenes in mouse, uh, which uh, are annotated as protein coding genes uh, by NCBI. So maybe they have become functional. And uh, if if you look at genome alignment, uh, we've now got they're just missing in now because this uh, uh, this retrogene uh, occurred in the mouse lineage. Uh, so if you take uh, all the NAURAT genes that were annotated and named by RefSeq, and you subtract the mouse genes projected by TOGA to NAURAT from that, then you get putative gene gains, but uh, they are really losses in mouse, because in order to get uh, a named uh, gene, it has to be homologous to, some, to something, usually 
usually to human. Uh, so the common ancestor probably did have it, and then mouse lost it. Uh, we have 69 such genes, and uh, seven of them are linked to diabetes. Uh, one example is the gene called AQP10. Uh, it actually does exist in mouse, but it has been pseudogenized. So this is the uh, orosomucoid gene cluster. Uh, so at the top uh, is uh, the gene cluster in the mouse. Uh, in the shown in the NCBI genome data viewer. And uh, you can see three functional genes uh, and a pseudogene. The bottom panel shows uh, uh, a section of the whole genome alignment uh, done using the Cactus software uh, of uh, uh, mouse genome against now rat. So here, uh, NARAD genome is the reference, and you have four uh, segments in mouse that align to the same place in the NARAD. So this was a fourfold duplication event in mouse. So another way to look at the differences uh, between genes, uh, in, in the two organisms is uh, uh, to look at all the genes that were annotated by NCBI in now rat and look at the toga projections of mouse genes. And there are 1,600 genes that were annotated by NCBI, but toga did not project any mouse genes to them. So these look like they are now rat specific. Uh, so, because we have predicted Go term uh, for all the protein coding gene that NCBI has annotated, uh, we could do the Go term enrichment analysis to try to figure out what these genes are, because most of them do not have names or assigned functions uh, by NCBI. Uh, looking at the top 20 or represented Go terms, uh, uh, a lot of them uh, are ribosomal-like uh, proteins. And it is well known from other species uh, that uh, there are, there are uh, retrogenes based on ribosomal, uh, de descended from ribosomal proteins that proliferate in the genome. So we're probably seeing the same phenomenon in now rat. Uh, and there are also a number of uh, uh, genes that are of viral origin which are probably uh, not, not real genes at all, but just the uh, endogenous retroviral elements that got annotated as genes. However, there are 1,600 of these. And if you look at uh, this shows how many genes were assigned to these different categories. So for example, 186 to structural uh, constituent of ribosome and uh, 44 to viral nucleic acid. Uh, so it's uh, at least some of these 1600 are probably not uh, just viral genes or, uh, or whatever, just ERVs or uh, ribosomal retrogenes. So when I was looking at examples, I uh, uh, encountered this. Uh, so. Uh, YBX3-like uh, uh, genes. Uh, so uh, YBX3 is uh, a member of a family uh, of, of Y-box binding proteins, which are a major group of cold shock proteins defined by the presence of a cold shock domain. Uh, the cold shock domain has uh, uh, has DNA and RNA binding capabilities. And among its uh, diverse biological roles, YBX3 is involved in nutrient sensing uh, and uh, 
also controls intracellular levels of uh, large neutral and aromatic amino acids, and these are potentially important for diabetes and other metabolic disorders. Uh, so uh, panel A in this slide uh, shows that NARAT uh, has over 100 of these YBX3-like elements interspersed um, throughout its genome. And uh, of these, uh, uh, 26 uh, were annotated as by RepSeq as uh, protein coding genes. Uh, uh, many more were annotated as pseudogenes. Uh, and then there are uh, blood uh, hits. And there's also a track here that shows uh, uh, segmental duplications of follicular basis and length uh, annotated by SEDEF, uh, which is part of Mark Chesson's uh, workflow. Uh, panel B shows the structure uh, of a typical uh, YBX3 like gene uh, or as a uh, uh, yeah, so it, so it has a one large exon, and usually they have one or two smaller exons, um, which are really small, and they are surrounded by these retroviral uh, elements. Um, so these uh, retroviral elements are probably what uh, sort of transports uh, the the large exon around the genome. Uh, and then uh, um, it can get connected to neighboring sequences uh, and that uh, may or may not create a functional gene. This is one of these YBX3-like genes where we actually have uh, transcripts uh, from the ISOSEQ experiment, which is shown on, in panel C. Uh, finally, panel D uh, uh, shows the multiple sequence alignment uh, of uh, uh, the YBX3-like uh, protein coding genes annotated by NCBI versus the canonical YBX3 gene. Uh, and uh, you can see that most uh, of this alliance, uh, there's a gap. Uh, the cold shock domain is somewhere around here. Uh, so the YBX3-like uh, proteins do still have it. So they, if they are, in fact, uh, uh, transcribed and translated, they have the potential to bind to DNA and do something. Um, also, this large exon in YBX3-like uh, in YBX3-like genes uh, encompasses several exons in the canonical gene, which is typical for better genes. Uh, Chantao Yang also uh, did the branch site uh, uh, test uh, analysis uh, to uh, find the genes that are under selective pressure in the NALRAT lineage. Uh, so in this analysis, now rat was compared to eight other uh, mouse-like uh, rodents from suborder suborder Myomorpha. So these are <clears throat> uh, rodents for rodent species for which we have genomes, and the genomes are published and kind of free to use. So he didn't uh, uh, use. Uh, genome annotations created by NCBI or Ensemble. Instead, he re-annotated all of them uh, using uh, the Exonerate software, which uh, does uh, spliced alignments of uh, proteins uh, to genomes. So he, he, he took human proteins and mapped them to all these genomes using Exonerate uh, in order for all of them to be annotated in a consistent manner. And so from this exercise, uh, he got almost 7,500 high quality archaeologous genes. 
and 119 of them uh, were positively selected uh, according to the branch side tests, and 19 of those are uh, linked to type 2 diabetes. This is one example, gene uh, uh, called XIAP, uh, X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis protein. Uh, so uh, this protein is uh, important in diabetes uh, in that it prevents apoptosis of islet B cells. And so it is uh, considered by some people uh, a therapeutic target, a potential therapeutic target. Uh, so there are three uh, mutations in this gene, uh, all three of which uh, come up as significant in Chantal's analysis. Uh, one uh, uh, 35, uh, three anion to proline, uh, is uh, on top. You can see uh, that there's a proline in the NAURAT uh, uh, protein and threonine in the other eight species and, and the human. Uh, and then uh, 190 is uh, tyrosine to phenylalanine and the same story. It's harder here to see because tyrosine and phenylalanine are very similar and so they're uh, shaded in the same way in the color coding scheme. Uh, and there's also a third one, uh, which is glycine to alanine at position 122. Uh, so we manually checked uh, all of these uh, to see if this makes sense. So uh, one interesting thing is that, is that this gene has a low mutation tolerance in, human, in humans. Uh, and uh, these uh, amino acids uh, are highly conserved across species. Uh, so in, in codon 135, threonine is in most mammals. There are only four mammals, uh, I think, uh, including uh, now rat, uh, that have a different uh, amino acid in this position. And uh, also there are disease variants in humans in, in nearby positions. Uh, a similar story uh, uh, for, oh, oh yeah, and humans do not have any variation in this amino acid. A similar story is with codon 190, uh, 122, uh, Having alanine uh, is unique among the rodents, but it, uh, if you look at a wider set of mammals, it's not conserved. And Hui Shitoa did much of this work. Uh, Yuri, just a reminder, you have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. All right, uh, I'm getting close to the end. Uh, so this table summarizes uh, genes that we found uh, interesting by various criteria and how many of them are linked to type 2 diabetes. And uh, our next steps, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, thinking of resequencing multiple NARAT individuals uh, because in uh, uh, Huishi's NARAT uh, colony, uh, there are some individuals uh, that are um, more sensitive to that induced diabetes than others. And so uh, we would like to um, uh, find out possible genetic determinants or other correlates of that. So other omics experiments are also being considered. And uh, we're thinking of doing more uh, on the cross-species comparisons. Uh, and uh, we're open to ideas and, cl and potential collaborations. Uh, acknowledgements. Uh, so I'd like to express my gratitude to our principal investigators, Ron Stewart and Jamie Thompson, uh, without whose leadership this project would not have been possible. We also had many collaborators and contractors who contributed in important ways. I feel very privileged and grateful to work with all of these people. And this is it. Great, uh, questions? So Yuri, I found uh, your cross 
cross species comparison very interesting. Uh, you found some uh, when you when you compared the um, species. I mean, now less specific uh, uh, genes. You tend to use the mouse as a comparison rather than using another rat. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yeah, it's actually phylogenetically a little bit closer to house mouse than to Norway rat. But uh, as far as I understand from uh, you know the the studies of uh, phylogeny that have been published, they are all uh, sort of about equidistant from each other. There was a radiation of uh, uh, murines uh, about eight to ten million years ago. And so the phylogenetic distance uh, between now rat to Norway rat or house mouse is about the same, but the mouse is a little bit closer. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I noticed that in some of your um, trees from individual genes, it also looks like it's more closer to the mouse than to the uh, Norway rat. Right, right. Um, right, right, right. Like right here. Well, well, here actually it's... Uh, uh, here you can see that it's it's a long branch, but yeah, it, it is it, it does it, it does cluster with the mouse, yeah. But now rat is a rat, right? <laughs> well, it's called. Uh, I mean, this is just a common name, right? It's a different genus, yeah. So, mouse and house mouse and um, rat, you know, ratus used to be in the in the same. Uh, genus until they were well I guess they're in the same genus wait a second so they used to be considered the same yeah no that's right same genus wait but they are at uh, uh, moose right is the genus for the mouse and uh, ratus is for the Norway rat and for uh, for for now rat is arvicantis so they're all different Can you tell us a little bit more about the biology, maybe in specific the longevity of the Nile rat? One of the cool things about Paramiscus is it lives to be eight to 10 years old, even in the wild. And I'm wondering whether the Nile rat has any tricks up its sleeve for longevity. No, I don't think it does. I, I think it's about three years, okay. two to three years. I don't know if Huishi is on the, if Huishi is on the call, she probably knows more. But yeah, I know that she's at a she's at a class somewhere, so she probably isn't. I guess where I'm going with that question, Yuri, is the analysis you applied to diabetes. I assume there are ten other mega traits you could uh, you could apply in the same sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, but no, Nairat is not known for its longevity, and. Uh, it's uh, sort of the main interest for us is the diabetes connection. And do you see loss of beta cells in old old rats, Nile rats? Um, or is it- That actually, I don't know. Uh, uh, I know that Huishi studies uh, the retinas a lot. So they, they have, uh, uh, diabetes related retinopathy. Okay. But so, I guess the assumption is that the diabetes that you're trying to model is type two insulin insensitivity diabetes. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. And it's induced by uh, feeding them uh, the the mouse uh, diet. So if, uh, if you feed them the standard mouse chow, they develop diabetes spontaneously. And wow. uh, that's detected by uh, 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 blood glucose. And also they get uh, damage to the retinas. Cool. Can you go back to the slide where you showed the haplotype contrast, the SNP density across the chromosomes, the circos plot? Um, and you were, you were hesitant about being adamant about this. It could be inbreeding or could just be the luck of the draw because you're just looking at two haplotypes of one individual. Uh, is there any plan to look at more individuals to see 
whether this is just the way the species is. Uh, you know, a species, if you looked at the hu human SNP density across the whole genome, you're gonna find hot spots and cold spots like this. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent this could be species level versus colony level versus family level. Right, we're, we're, we're certainly, uh, um, uh, we're, we're, we're certainly planning to resequence more now rats from the colony. And I, I think uh, we should got some contacts in Africa, so we might be getting some wild specimens as well at some point. Cool. I have a uh, question about this as well. So these are these structural variants are derived by comparing the two assemblies, right? The uh, primary and the alternative. Yeah, it's a whole genome alignment of the two assemblies. Have you uh, aligned the raw sequencing reads to the assemblies and see if you still find uh, structural variants? Uh, or that, it, I don't know, uh, actually. I, I don't know if it's part of Chen Tao's workflow. I think I know that the main uh, uh, the main way he's doing it is is just a whole genome alignment. Um, so yeah. Did, is this a female say. or or a male sample you did? If it's a female, uh, it's, I would expect to see an X. Uh, it is a male. Okay. All right, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the VGP prefers uh, sequencing males because you can get a Y chromosome. Got it. Be interesting to look at the pseudo-autosomal region of the of chromosome X. That gave that's given everybody quite a bit of problem in rat and in mouse until quite recently. Mm -hmm. So what what kind of problem? To get with chromosome X. Say, say that again, Yuri. What kind of problem do you have with chromosome oh, X? It, it's just it's just quite difficult to determine where the boundaries of the pseudoautosomal region or regions are. So humans have two pseudoautosomal regions, one on each end of the chromosome, and then one that's sort of a pseudo pseudoautosomal region in the middle. Um, right. Mice only have one on the distal chromosome X. And I think that's also true of uh, Norvegicus, although I, I may be remembering this incorrectly. Yeah, yeah, that makes actually assembling the Y chromosomes very challenging as well. And we only get partial, you know. I, I think in now that we actually, we don't have a Y chromosome. We have some contexts that are, or some scaffolds that are assigned to, to Y. Oh. Yeah. Well, you'd have a good idea just by looking at the gene lists that annotate in those regions, and that would give you a heads up of whether it's likely to be pseudo-autosomal or not. Right, right. There are some genes that are Y-specific. And so that 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 that's how we are able to assign some scaffolds to the y chromosome. Yeah. Any uh, other questions? Uh, this is Ron here. I just wanted to say that uh, we are interested in the longevity question, although I'm not sure how well we'll be able to approach it. Um, Yuri and, and everybody has been working on the Etruscan shrew, which is one-tenth the size of the mouse, um, yet it lives about the same length of time. So it might be interesting to look at that with regard to some of the analyses that Yuri and team have done uh, with regard to longevity once we uh, finalize that data. Cool. Uh, and then whales, of course, uh, are... You know, popular for longevity research because they large whales live a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great and um, concluding. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, at our uh, Yuri, thank you very much for the presentation and thank you everyone for um, attending. And we'll see you guys next month. Thank you. Bye bye.